the Right Guy Podcast, where the Second Amendment is absolute. And now your hosts, Max McGuire and Josh Hammerling. Welcome back to another edition of the Right Guys Podcast. As you just heard, my name is Max McGuire here. Sorry, I just had that. No, I was going to introduce you. I love that, do that. I mean, I thought you'd give me the cue. (laughs) With producer Josh Hammerling. Um, A bit to talk about. We're going to to do history, a a few history stories. People like um, when we were at Conservative Daily, we used to do history episodes. Second half of the the podcast, we're going to talk about some historical heroes, some badasses from World War II um, who just you read these stories of what they did for them, for their, their, their comrades, their country. Amazing. Like definitely the greatest generation. So we're going to talk about that. But before we get into that, got to talk about the story of the day. Mm-hmm. Diane, Diane Feinstein passed away at the age of 90. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just the uh, story of the day. Ooh, this is story of the month. I've got a lot to say about this, but mm-hmm. Josh, why don't you start us off? Dianne Feinstein, uh, probably the single greatest enemy to the Second Amendment that's ever existed in the history of the United States. And that is probably not an, exa- that's not an exaggeration. She's no. the only person I know that whose career was built on liberal politics that focused on disarming, dismantling the Second Amendment. Yeah. You know, peace be with her. May she make heaven. All that, all that stuff. We never wish bad on anyone, but she was a true enemy of the Second Amendment. And enemy of the First Amendment. That too. <laughs> I mean, yep. At post um, uh, Columbine, she was most like that was the real tear from her. Uh, I think it was 1992 ish. She was working with Clinton. Well, she she, she pushed all before, kinds of bands. She pushed it through before Columbine, and the, the yeah. great the great irony is that the assault weapon ban didn't stop Columbine. The National Firearms Act didn't stop didn't Columbine. Stop they used yeah. a sawed-off shotgun. Um, yeah. The Gun Control Act of 1968 didn't stop Columbine because they used a straw purchaser. Mm. I mean, these mass shootings, what they show us time after time is that the laws that the left says they need to pass to prevent the mass shootings wouldn't have been passed. Like, like, And, and, and they would say, well, it'll stop the next one. But if you keep paying attention, the next one never comes. Mm-hmm. Right, they never stop anything. They never do anything but disarm law-abiding Americans. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know me. Anyone who's followed us since the conservative daily days, um, I don't like to speak ill of the dead, um, but I, I firmly and adamantly believe that if someone is an enemy of the republic, enemy of the constitution, enemy of the American people, someone is my enemy, who made it their life's mission to throw me in prison throw josh in prison throw many of the people watching and listening to this podcast in prison they don't get a eulogy in my opinion they don't get a rest in peace i'm not gonna give them um best of luck in the afterlife no and and the flip side also this isn't a celebration we're not celebrating the fact that she is gone um because that's not right to do either um at the very least, she had friends and family who loved her, despite all of her obvious flaws, and they are heartbroken. So this isn't a day to celebrate. It's not a national holiday. But um, it's definitely a day to recognize that she was an enemy of the people in more ways than one. And the country is without a doubt better off with her no longer in the halls of power no longer voting on legislation, no longer writing legislation, Mm -hmm. and no longer having her staffers vote on her on her behalf, which is a crazy part of this story. Yeah, she's always been a solid anti gun vote, no matter who was trying to pass what bill. And if it wasn't her leading the charge, it it would have been one of the cronies inside there with her. And she was always like a guaranteed vote, always a guaranteed vote. Was there ever a gun control measure? She didn't vote no one. Single one. No, that would be the challenge, and I think the answer. She was is the no. leading author of all of them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. blows me away. She is. She was directing the charge at destruction of the Second Amendment in the United yeah. States. And she was, but 
in the end, we know that she had named her daughter, I believe it was, as uh, someone who could manage her affairs. So she had gave power of attorney to her daughter, which, if anything, after this, we have to change the law in this country that if someone in Congress has given power of attorney to someone else to manage their affairs, they are in no position to manage the affairs or the interests of their constituents. I think that's yeah. a very fair compromise because she was allegedly voting at a time where she had crossed the T's dotted the I's on paperwork saying that she was unfit to manage her own affairs. Mm -hmm. And I say allegedly because I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we suspect that there was a bit of weekend at Bernie's going on, especially with the inability to vote remotely because of COVID. Um, apparently she voted yesterday. Um, that I, 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 we're going to learn more as we learn about the circumstances yeah. of her yeah. death. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if this was something sudden, um, or if she was on her deathbed and somehow managed to vote, we're going to learn more about that as, um, as the days and weeks pass. But I think what's very obvious, Josh, is mm -hmm. that she wasn't calling the shots in the end. I, I feel like. Think about how power hungry one side has to be to roll somebody out who's at death's door to get a vote out of them. Yeah. Where's the respect for that person, the respect for the office, the respect for decorum, just dignity of that person. That's all missing in that scenario. Yeah. And then nobody ever expects to die. Like it's never planned, right? So, I mean, they were rolling her out doing that job. I mean, there's even audio of her saying, how do I vote? And they're telling her, vote yeah. yes. Remember that one? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So somebody's doing the work for her, I didn't vote for that person. I didn't vote for her daughter to take over affairs and start getting those votes out. I didn't vote for for a shadow group behind the person to pass legislation. It, who's tweeting for her? You pointed that to me the other day. It's yeah, like, who, no, who's been tweeting for her? We can go ahead or and put it up, What do they call it? I'll, I'll go ahead and put it up on the screen. Yeah. Um, I mean, are, are we really supposed to believe that in the final moments of her life, mm -hmm. she put out a tweet? talking about Azerbaijani policy. Like, are, are we really supposed to believe this? And you can see on the bottom, I, I actually tweeted, I don't think anyone believes that when Dianne Feinstein was on her deathbed, she wanted her final tweet ever to be about Azerbaijani policy. It, it just, it's Woo! insane. I know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's insane. Yeah. So if she's on her deathbed, someone in her office feels that they have the go-ahead mm -hmm. to start talking about foreign policy. Like I don't know enough about um, Azerbaijan. I know there's a lot of a lot of conflict still over mm -hmm. Armenians, the Armenian genocide. It's a very hot button issue. I mean, just <laughs> did she just... have the capacity to understand, like, to put these out? I mean, she looked like she was in really bad shape for a while. Yeah. Max, I mean, really bad shape, and unfortunately, she's passed because of it. But. It just shows you that the people she she just has a social media team, and they're putting out points. So if she's not really conducting this kind of work herself, it's but just do we this group really, behind her doing it? Do we really think that she had a substantive conversation with her staff about the ins and outs of Azerbaijani politics as it relates to Armenians and um, a, the the Nagorno Karabakh region? Not at all. And military operations. Does anyone really think that this was like cleared? Because yeah. it doesn't pass the smell test for me at all. She, she didn't even know how long away she was from the Senate when she was sick. She said she never left. She didn't even know how long, dude. And it's like, and now you're talking about this policy here? Like it's, you know, something you've always had a passion about? Yeah. I don't know. I, I think that there absolutely has to be an investigation into just how much of her final acts in Congress were her own doing. Mm -hmm. How much of it was a weekend at Bernie's kind of situation with her well, handlers propping her up and voting for her and telling her how to vote? Because, like, she's an enemy of the Republic, right? But you don't ever want to see... The only thing I really feel bad about was how used she was. Like, yeah, elder abuse. Absolutely. People would take advantage of people in old age. Yeah there's a special circle of hell for these people, right? And so I, I sympathize with her in that 
in that respect. But I kind of stopped because in her fleeting moments of clarity and sanity, she was still coming after our most basic fundamental rights. Mm -hmm. So it's tough, but we have to have a full investigation into this because it's not just her. It's Mitch McConnell. Yeah. It's Joe Biden. Joe Biden. I definitely say Joe Biden. He's got it. She didn't know where she was at. There's times Joe Biden doesn't know where he is or what he is doing. Right. And that is the office of the president. That is the chief executive, man. That's it. Doesn't get bigger than that. Yeah, they're bigger than that. It, it's. But then, who's calling those shots? What group is this? Is it just their aides? That's I mean, there's no way to pinpoint who's who's who's, 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 who's who's calling the shots. Who's in control of the United States? Yeah, that, that's that's where you get into deep state conspiracy theories this, that aren't really yeah. conspiracy theories. They're just theories. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. Do you think they're real, Max? Do you think there's a shadow government running everything? Do you? It wasn't Diane Feinstein. It wasn't Diane Feinstein. Like, That's right. it's not Mitch McConnell. Like, Mitch McConnell gave that speech before, um, what was it? Was it a, not the Rotary Club? It was, it was before, like, uh, the, what's the, what's yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Ch- chamber, chamber of commerce. And that's when he had his blank stare. Yeah. Like. Totally frozen. The chamber is the chamber of commerce part of pulling those levers. I mean, they've controlled Republican politics for a long time on a lot of issues, especially immigration. I don't know. It's there's more questions than answers. Yeah. And while I understand how Republicans like like uh, Susan Collins or Lisa Murkowski are eulogizing Diane Feinstein, I, I I can't allow it. Yeah. Um. Not gonna spit on her grave. Not gonna. Mm-hmm wish her ill in the afterlife but it's important that we at least for a little bit on this episode talk about just how horrible she was Hmm. and i have a few clips that i've pulled i had to really dig deep into the the rolodex of my clips on my external hard drive because you yeah well i name things and i save them yeah and i almost forgot about this one we, we say she wanted to throw us in prison. She really did. Yeah. And she really wanted to disarm the American people. And here she is in an interview. I believe this was in the 1990s, shortly after the assault weapon ban was passed in 1994. Here's Dianne Feinstein saying if she could have done it, she would have just taken all of the guns. Senator Dianne Feinstein worked for more than a year to get the assault weapons bill passed in the face of ferocious opposition from the National Rifle Association. She says she got the best she could. If I could have gotten 51 votes in the Senate of the United States for an outright ban, picking up every one of them, Mr. and Mrs. America, turn them all in, I would have done it. I could not do that. The votes weren't here. The votes weren't here. If she could have done it, she would have. Would have. Well, Josh, Let as we were getting ready, in. I mean, as she... yeah, as we were getting ready to come on, we were playing a little game. Maybe we should play it right now. Okay. How many felonies mm. would we have committed if she had her way? I mean, just <laughs> in arm's reach of me. I mean, I know you have a lot in your arm's reach. I'm looking around me, and. If she had her way, I'm just looking at, I'd be in prison for thousands of years. Yeah. Uh, I, thousands I, of I, years. I have nothing and I wouldn't be, uh, I, I wouldn't be in charge for that anything. <laughs> 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 like, like, just like this. Uh, this is my FN 509 yeah. compact yeah. tactical. This is my concealed carry pistol. It has a threaded barrel. Oh my it is God. a threaded barrel. That you know, would be a felony. It, it's dangerous that would be a to felony. put a threaded barrel on. It's dangerous to put a threaded barrel on stuff. It's dangerous. It's a felony. It's a felony. This, this is a, a Saturday night special. Ooh. Doesn't have doesn't have a serial number because it's so old. Yeah. She'd want me to throw me in prison for that. Right. Oh. Uh, oh my gosh. Ballistic armor. Protective equipment. Ballistic yeah. armor. That would be what we call a felony. Super secret illegal. Look how dangerous it is. Yeah. Look how dangerous yeah. it is. Yeah, I've shown it on the show before, but if she saw this, she'd just spasm and and spontaneously combust. Right, she'd set on fire and melt, <laughs> melt. Yeah, that's what she. Yeah, and she labeled like not just 
You're trying to make us criminals. She didn't want to just call us bag out. <laughs> this is a bag <laughs> just full of 30 round magazines. Yeah, I had to get rid of all of mine. Yeah, I know. It's gave it to me. <laughs> I know. Uh, no, Pretty but well. there's probably a couple, like 100 mags in there. Yeah. Five years a piece. Five years a piece? Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying half a, half a millennia of jail time. Yeah. And that's just in the bag. Half of a millennia. That's just in the bag. I got oh. other ones. I got other ones floating around that would hey, attack do you have, on. Do you have dangerous ammo? Uh, I do. Oh, no. Somewhere. Oh, uh, like hollow points or something? Or, or Oh, or, definitely. Or, yeah. What about a full metal jacket? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hollow points. That's, oh, that's no. double illegal. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. That's like probably yeah, full metal jacket. Also super oh, no. secret illegal. Oh, no, is it high powered? Uh, depends. Depends on who you ask. <laughs> depends on who you exactly. A real shooter knows what to say. Yeah, this one though, worst of the worst. The pistol grip. Yeah. Ooh. 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 <laughs> Five years. If I put it on a gun. Five years. And she had her way. Five years. I'm, just, I'm looking around. I'm surrounded by it. Right. I'm, I'm worried that by this it. will be next. You know, I might get, you know, now that I'm on the internet, I, oh, yeah. this, yeah, I'm waiting for this one to happen. Let's, let's talk about that because there is yeah. something that she did in 2013. Yeah. And and, and listen, I, I, I get it that a lot of people aren't as passionate about her no longer being in the halls of power as I am. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, you have to understand. <laughs> but yeah, you, you have to understand. I worked at Conservative Daily for eight years. Yeah. And it was my daily mission to stop people like her. I don't think people know just how close we came to losing so many of our most fundamental rights. And and we won some of these fights on a razor edge. Like it could have gone either way. Like it, it's 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 so hard to put it past behind me. Because my entire adult life, most of my adult life after grad school was dedicated to stopping her, to mm -hmm. stopping her. Mm. And we, we were successful with all the people who followed us back then. We were successful. It's, it's, but I'm, I'm, I'm still perplexed at how many felonies <laughs> she would, have, she would have before right now. Um, Think about all the people that joined her and celebrated this. Yeah. Right, who were, who were truly part of trying to limit, yeah, your rights, right? I mean, they're. Yeah. I, oh, I didn't realize that she was around the Harvey Milk time. Yeah, well, she's real old. That um, would that was that blew my mind. In San this Fran. is what this is what I wanted to cover too. A lot of people don't know about this. I covered it at Conservative Daily. What is it? Uh, a couple organizations covered it in 2013. Diane Feinstein tried to pass an amendment to a Senate bill to redefine what a journalist is and to exclude bloggers and podcasters on the internet. So like she Whoa, literally, she literally, Josh. Yeah. She literally tried to strip the first amendment protections that you and I enjoy in this podcast and the other podcasts that we've done yes. in the past. She literally wanted to strip us of our first amendment protections. Right. And, this is and like this is the public square now, Max. This is yeah. where people get the voice out. That's why this is being the thing that allows us to fight the fight, right? Because it's, yeah. it's all done over the internet now. And to take that position, I mean, the first thing you do is you disarm the populace. And the second thing you do is you yeah. make sure they, they can't talk bad about what the totalitarian government's doing. Yeah. So the way she wanted to define a journalist, just so everyone's clear. Oh, my God. It, she wanted it to be a salaried employee, independent contractor, or agent of an entity, entity that disseminates news or information. Okay. Who, who gets to, okay. They then had to, for a continuous three month period within the two years pro, prior to the date, have substantially contributed as an author, editor, photographer, or producer to a significant number of articles, stories, programs, or publications by an entity within two years prior of the relevant date. The relevant date is them being prosecuted, right? Or them being investigated. That's the relevant date. Or they could be a student journalist. So probably I would have been covered Whoa. because I was working at Conservative Daily. But so many people online, they just say, yeah. oh, you didn't, you didn't substantially 
contribute a significant number. And look at look at how subjective that was going to be. Right. What's an entity? The start. Yeah. What, what, yeah. What, 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 I'm an entity. This is an entity. The show's an entity. I mean, it's it's. Yeah. What would you define that? And the, it goes on. And I mean, the second part yeah. was was the uh, a significant, substantially contributed. What does yeah. that mean? One, five. I don't know. Eleven. It's up you to know? the eyes of the prosecutor. That's how crazy this was. And That's how only, crazy she wanted to make this. And only people that were in colleges are already known for their super liberal ideas would be on, would be yeah, accepted, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, whoa. You'd have a guaranteed flood of liberal information making its way out of the universities, unchecked yeah. and unabated. And government controlling who could say what. And, and it's not just the journalism part of the First Amendment. She had contempt for religious belief. Remember no. when really? Amy Coney Barrett was before the Senate, she questioned her and accused her of having, quote, the dogma living within her and saying that was a problem. We, I have that clip. Here we go. Uploading it. When you read your speeches, um, the conclusion one draws is that the dogma lives loudly within you. And that's of concern when you come to big issues that large numbers of people have fought for for years in this country. That's of concern, Josh, that she's guided by her own religious beliefs. Even though she said she's guided in a judicial capacity, she's guided by the Constitution and the law. The fact that she has deeply held religious beliefs on a, on a personal level, uh, right. that was concerning to Dianne Feinstein. As Remember, this is, someone, this is someone who put her hand on the Bible or whatever book she wanted to put it on and mm -hmm. sort of uphold the First mm -hmm. Amendment and defend the mm -hmm. First Amendment. When in reality, when that, when that oath of office talked about defending it against the enemy's domestic, she was the enemy domestic. No, dogma lives deeply within her. The look That's on concerning. On um, Amy Cohen's face is, you know, she, it's like yeah. you could just feel she just wanted to reach out and slap her. Like, are you really yeah. going after my religion? We have religious liberty. I can be a judge and still have a religion. Yeah. Or a lack thereof. Yeah. It's it's the choice of her. And it's concerning. Why is it concerning? Because she might make decisions that, that might be based on scripture or or a moral compass guided by, you know, a religion. Sometimes you think you would want that from a judge, right? Somebody yeah. who would be forgiving or thinking of forgiving or, or trying to make people better in the end. I have to say I am. I, I do kind of like when, when she talked about you're going to have this dogma and it's going to reverse rights and issues that people have fought about, fought over mm -hmm. for a long time. It does. I do feel really warm and fuzzy when I know that Barrett contributed to exactly <laughs> that. You know, what I mean, like I do feel a little warm and fuzzy, like like shutting down Roe versus Wade, uh, New York you State Rifle Pistol Association like, v. Bruin, like yeah, that yeah. that when Amy Coney Barrett got through, mm -hmm. she was the nail in the coffin for so many of the policies that Diane Feinstein had dedicated her life to advancing. I do, though, feel bad that Dianne Feinstein won't be able to see her legacy completely dismantled. Like, maybe that makes me a little bit of a sicko, but I would have <laughs> loved, like, no, like, literally any day wow. right now, yeah. Judge Benitez in California is set to issue a ruling in the Miller case, which he's already done it once. He's going to do it again, overturn California's assault weapon ban. I'm sad that Dianne Feinstein didn't get to experience that. Because... Again, I think in a just world, someone who's dedicated her life to dismantling our rights should have been able to watch her hopes and her dreams and her ambitions go up in smoke around her and realize that she accomplished very little. You see, I don't wish people ill, Producer Josh. I don't wish ill on anyone. What I tend to wish on them is mediocrity. I, when I have an enemy, I hope that they are mediocre and I hope that they know they're mediocre because that is far worse than wishing anything ill on them. Knowing, 
knowing that that when they tally up the accomplishments, it'll be left wanting. And she will not have left a legacy that will last. Call me a sicko. No. But I'm sorry, when you dedicate your life to eliminating my right to defend myself and my family and my neighborhood and my community, I'm sorry, I want you to experience watching that movement collapse. And she was days away from seeing it, Josh. Oh. Judge Benitez just overturned the, the large capacity magazine ban. He's yeah. days oh away from issuing the ruling on this. And I, I, oh I wish oh she would have just hung on a little longer. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. He's not. So, I mean, yeah. I I wish I had come up with a better monologue myself. <laughs> no, I mean that's that's beautiful. Like what you said, you said it. <laughs> like, but like, think about it. Could, and you're passionate. Like you feel like this is old. Like this is old yeah, stuff. No, this, like coming. Oh, keep going. Th this is from the foundation of my political experience. Yeah. My my yeah. entry yeah. into adult politics yeah. after high school and college and graduate school. I entered cool. into yeah. this. I entered into this industry political science politics media i entered into this industry right out of, out of the fire out of the frying pan into the fire right? yeah, yeah. You i got, mean you, like and the politics of personal destruction liberals like the blue states gaining power yeah you, you were on that that pin, like you were on the pendulum swing like, to the like far left when you were writing in that wouldn't you love to just be a fly on the wall and what and have and have obama react to Obamacare being dismantled? Like, wouldn't you love to be that fly on the wall? I'd pay money to watch that. Like, 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 like that's what I hope of my enemies. I don't wish them will, ill will. I don't wish anything negative. I hope that they amount for nothing. And I hope that when the, the, the bards sing songs of their life, they are short songs and they are meaningless. And when the history textbooks write of their accomplishments, they are given nothing more than a footnote. That's what I wish on these people. Sorry. I, I mean, I liked it. That's why I listened to the show. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> if you like the show, subscribe. We're on Rumble. We're on YouTube. Uh, I think I'm on my Twitter just because I can. Uh, also, audio links in the description. If you haven't already, do subscribe to those. Help us out as we grow. Um, well, good, man. Like, like, you got something off your chest there. Like, I could tell that was something that, you know, from your yeah. very start of your career where you, you fought hard for it, right? And Oh, and, and listen, she's continuously lost, right? Yeah. The writing's been on the wall. So I am a little, I am a little okay with the fact that I think in the end she knew that she lost. Like, yeah. I think in the end she knew there would never again be a national assault weapon ban. I think she knew that the state level bans are on borrowed time. I think she knew that mm -hmm. all of these gun control efforts she had advanced will, will disappear in weeks or months. I think she knew that. But man, I imagine look at all that work she put in for those decades to, to advance her cause and try to make that happen. I mean, that, yeah. that just shows you the constant assault. That is on all of your rights every single day. People that are actively in, yep. in, in the Senate, in the House of Representatives that, that want to take this stuff away from you and the people yep. you love. So that's really, that's the issue, right? Everybody wants to take your rights. And that's the danger, right? Mm -hmm. I, I say this all the time, but it's true. Ronald Reagan, he, you know what? He had a lot of problems when it came to the Second Amendment. Um, Ronald Reagan banned open and concealed banned open carry in California because the black Panthers were open carrying. So like he is not the second amendment guy and he was good for other reasons, but he's not in our corner on this. And you hear Gavin Newsom today talking about the history of gun control in California. He hat tips to Ronald Reagan and he feels very awkward doing it. Um, yeah, I'm sure he does. He, he feels very, very awkward doing it. But Ronald Reagan has saying that your rights are never more, than a generation away from extinction. I believe that your rights are never more than a couple votes mm -hmm. away from extinction. And when you have someone like Dianne Feinstein, who is dedicating her life every day to that fight, Josh, they only need to get it right once. Yeah. We, on the defending side, we need to get it right every, every single, single time, time, every issue. They only need to get it right once. Mm -hmm. And the fact that between 2012 and now, she didn't succeed... Huge, huge. Yeah. 
So now who's going to take up the mantle? Somebody's going to use that. I mean, it's all political issues. Somebody's going to be picked in the party to go after it, right? And be the bulldog on it. And they're going to want another Diane. So wait for that. You know, that's going to end up showing here soon. Then it starts all over. Like the cycle starts new. Are you drinking a beer? I am. I am. Lucky son. I, I, I said I wasn't going to celebrate, but I'm drinking a beer. I saw the beer. I was like, it, it, it's it's a homebrew beer. It's <laughs> my own homemade. Oh, that's your. What is that pumpkin, one called? Pumpkin ale. You made pumpkin ale. Mm -hmm. See, really that's good. why when the zombie apocalypse hits, the first person I'm going to go save is going to be Max because we got to <laughs> have the beer maker. No, I mean like I got guns, ammo. Well, mate, we'll go team up on the border. Uh, I have a five gallon jug of mead over there, just chilling, just waiting. <laughs> Uh, you're like the 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 bruise uh, bullets and uh, something guy. You got to come up with some like a third. Well, one. if I can do it myself, I want to learn yeah. how to do it myself. Right? Yeah, yeah. So like I have, yeah. I have a bunch of little pepper plants growing under some T5 really? lighting because I I like jalapeno peppers and I think it'd be cool just to be able to grab a pepper anytime I want it. So I'm I'm trying to learn these basic skills, um, making yeah. my own alcohol. I started making my own alcohol after Bud Light did that bullshit. I said, never yeah. again. Not only am I done with Bud Light, I'm done trusting any uh, the, uh, the beer manufacturers. Maker. Really? Any of the major ones. Coors yeah. Light's just as bad. Coors Light's just as bad. Just as worse. Yeah. Yeah, I guess they are. I mean, they've all kept their mouth shut, right? Like, whoever's uh, on the. You, you can <laughs> dig. You can find it. It's I mean, there, like, but... Jack Daniels did a tranny night, did a tranny <laughs> ad. I mean, like, it's everywhere, Josh. Really? Can't escape it. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to find it. I'll do it. No. See, well, actually, yeah. Why don't you bring it? Because I don't know if that one is real. I'm like, really? Coors Light? Because I love the Coors Light tour or the Coors tour. It's a free beer at the end. Can't drink when you go over there. I mean, you have to drink when you're, when you're in Golden. At least we didn't. Uh, I got nothing there. I'm just waiting for this video. Because when I see, yeah. Uh, Here's the uh, Jack Daniels fire ad campaign with the drag queens. <laughs> They're beautiful. See? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so, so brave. So stunning. Wait, so that, brave. It looks like a really crappy bottle of Jack that's. Well, to Jack, to Jack Fire, it's like, it's their, like their take oh, on Fireball. Fireball. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Um, but like, you can't, you can't trust Jack Daniels. Like, you start going down the list yeah. and you like, look at like Jameson Irish Whiskey. And like they are doing BS. Like all of these companies at one point in time have succumbed to the wokeness. And it's not just like like gay rights. It's like hardcore diving headfirst into the kiddie pool kind of wokeness. You should just call it the, like the Max McGuire non woke brew. And we'll start yeah. a brew house. Yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah. do a non woke brewery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. Oh, I, 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 I just need enough to, for my. I, I have a pretty good setup. I have like a, I have a nine gallon electric brew kettle. You know, I, I got, I got, I, got <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I got, I have a kegerator because I got tired of bottling. Yeah, I, I got the setup. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow, good for you, man. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. The it's all, it's all because of Dylan Mulvaney. Thanks, Dylan. Right. Learned a skill. I did, I did this during, uh, during the Colin Kaepernick too. Anyone remembers from the conservative oh, daily yeah. days, I stopped watching football. I was a big football fan. Yeah. Stopped watching football because I was adamant that politics is my job. I don't want it infecting yeah. my pastimes. So I started taking up hobbies, Josh. I got um, into woodworking. I became yeah. an amateur gold miner. I'm like really I was going into the creeks of Colorado and digging up gold on Sunday mornings. Panning's fun. Let's let nobody tell you otherwise. Yeah. And if you, when you do get like some of those little, little, itty oh, just a couple of flakes, gold, it just makes it all work. You're just like, yeah. So yeah. try it if you've never done it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. 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 I remember all those every time you did. And uh, the NFL, Colin Kaepernick, have you, have you heard that he, he wrote a really desperate letter to oh, one of the teams? Come on. Come on. No, not one of the teams. My team, New York Jets. To the Jets. Oh, so you have been paying attention. <laughs> no, because, because I love Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. You saw what Aaron Rodgers said? They, they said he got injured because of the Vax, and he told Keith Oberman to go get his sixth booster uh, <laughs> on ESPN. <laughs> Good old Aaron Rodgers. But, but yeah, like, man, he, his whole career went to the crapper for, I mean, was that like, the, that couldn't have been wokeness. Was that, I mean, that was like a different. No, one. no, he, he, I mean, listen, he's, he's kind of a hippie. Right. So like, yeah. in terms of like I'm, him going to South America, like doing ayahuasca, I'm not all into that, right? 
but like I'll go ahead and put up my my screen. This was moments before Aaron Rodgers tore his Achilles tendon. Running onto the field, carrying an American flag on September 11th. Does anyone in their right mind think that the organization that had him run on the field with an American flag would replace him with Colin Kaepernick, a man who refuses to show any respect for the flag? Like, come on. That's the yeah. stupidest, the stupidest follow-up I could ever even, like, think of. Makes me like I, Rogers more than I see that picture. That's kind of, that's a, that's an iconic photo. Really. Oh, it is. And then four plays in, he tore his Achilles. But I was watching. he's I already, know. he's already out of a walking boot. That's Three incredible. and a half weeks. That's Three incredible. Three and a half weeks. He's on crutches, three and a half weeks. Yeah. Usually six to eight weeks is when you're on crutches. He is shooting for a return this season. They did a, a video during one of the Monday night games that showed the procedure he had. And um, it was like on Thursday night football. The experiment. Oh, well, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And could you imagine like the, the things that they've learned to do because of sports injuries? It's incredible. It's minimally invasive. Minimally I invasive. I mean, it's got to be a fortune to get it done. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's It's got to be expensive. But for a guy like that, that's crazy. Oh wow! Let's see if I can find it. Um, I really like. He's a weird cat. Yeah, you're right. Rogers is a hippie, but I mean, at least he goes out there loving America, because that's what you want to see. That's what that's what the people who want shit they want the product to be, right? Yeah, they're just trying to give people product they don't want, and that's that's why there's this huge clash culturally. What's going on? I mean, they're trying to feed you something and make you like a choice. Like yeah. if you want to be part of something, you want to make that choice. That's fine. You just can't expect everybody to to be part of it. Oh my gosh, that looks great. So, so this is the this is the yeah. procedure that they did on him. So it's minimally invasive, and they basically drill into his heel, have an anchor point in his heel, oh and gosh. then they they feed these threads in through his heel, um, yeah. to basically tie together the Achilles tendon. So oh much less invasive than yeah. typical surgery. Like this is like, look, this Holy is crap. Yeah. And now they, they just pull it together and then it heals itself. And apparently it can, he, you can heal faster with this. So, My goodness. I'm, I'm like, excited. That makes people queasy. Like, you know, um, I forgot whoever the host crew was on Thursday at football that they got kind of, Oh yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're like, like, Oh, why are they showing that? Oh, I'm like, oh come on. Come on. <laughs> Hey, Come people, on. dude, people are weird. I've seen some people see blood and pass out, so. I know, people are weird. I guess that people way. Are weird. All right, you, you, want, you want to tell some some good stories and Friday yeah, first off, on a good like, note? Well, Friday, like, I always feel like something on Friday, whenever we can, we should recognize, you know, heroism or people that serve or great Americans and stuff like that. I think Max has always had this as a passion, too. So, he turned me on to what is CMOHS. This is the uh, yeah, the Congressional the, Medal, of, Medal Honor of Honor. And if you haven't gone there to read the just the, the stories of the people that have been there, it yeah, it'll blow your mind. It'll show you why people end up earning those medals. And of course, I miss um, I lost that veto one. I, I, I clicked on the chaplains. Well, gosh darn it. Well, I'll start with at least Travis Atkins. This was a, a fairly um, new one. He won the Medal of Honor. Uh, because you want, uh, you want to share your screen so people can see a picture of him. You want me to pull it up, Travis Atkins? Yeah, Travis Atkins. And uh, I'm just gonna start reading while you do that. Star Staff Sergeant Atkins was a uh, in a two pairs and was crossing an intersection not far from his position. So four suspicious individuals come walking in on his position. Sergeant Atkins immediately moved his squad to interdict the individuals. One of the individuals began behaving erratically, prompting Staff Sergeant Atkins to disbark from his patrol vehicle and approach to conduct a search. Both individuals responded belligerently towards Staff Sergeant Atkins, who then engaged the individual he had intended to search in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So mm -hmm. whoever he was, he got into a hand fight with him, right? Staff Sergeant Atkins tried to wrestle the insurgent's arms behind his back. Once he noticed the insurgent was reaching for something under his clothes, Staff Sergeant Atkins immediately get this. He wrapped himself in a bear hug and threw him to the ground away from his fellow soldiers. Yeah. Imagine that. Staff Sergeant Atkins maintained his hold on the insurgent, placing his body on top of him, further sheltering his patrol. With Staff Sergeant Atkins on top of him, the insurgents detonated the bomb strapped to his body, killing Staff Sergeant Atkins. Staff Sergeant Atkins acted with complete disregard for his own safety in this critical and selfless act of valor. Staff Sergeant Atkins saved the lives of three other soldiers who were with him and gallantly gave his life for his country. Staff Sergeant Atkins 
undaunted courage, warrior spirit, and steadfast devotion to duty are in keeping with the highest traditions of military service and reflect the great credit upon himself, the 2nd Brigade Combat Team, and the United States Army. I mean, that right there, to grab somebody yeah. who you think has got a bomb strapped to him and pull him away from people, my only regret is that it was given to him posthumously. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. So that one kind of grabbed me when I was reading through him because it's modern. You know, somebody alive today, that's that's somebody that is in their family who earned the Medal of Honor. So we thank oh, them for, sure. for their service in that one. So it hit me in the feels, man. It hit me yeah, in the feels. No, that's that's completely fair. I mean, I, I read through so many of these and I only got through A to D. Yeah. Alphabetically. Did you really? Yeah. And I started seeing them and I, I had to stop myself because I started reading them and they're short. It's like threw himself on a grenade to save his buddies. I and I started seeing so many of them. So I started skipping over them. And I'm just thinking that alone, right? Like some of these other stories are, are much more in depth, but hit me. Th they're hit me. All what, which one did you like? Because um, I'm, I'm... I, I loved, I loved the story of, uh, let me put it up on the screen. Um, sorry. I'm just managing all of the different screens. Herbert F. Christian. Christensen. Oh, I remember. Yeah. So Herbert F. Christian. Um, so he was in Italy and he was at this spot. I actually found a map of it. Highway six. It kind of was the route from Naples to Rome. Um, and he encountered the enemy. And when I say the enemy, I, I think what we have to really explain was 60 soldiers, three machine guns and three tanks 30 yards away from him. And he had his unit. So one of the tanks fired its main cannon and blew his leg off. <laughs> his right leg below the knee, gone. Yeah. Now, anyone else, that's it. You're done. Herbert Christian, he had that dog in him. And he decided that he wasn't going to go out this way. And he was going to try and take the fight to the enemy so that his buddies could escape. So he hobbled on his left knee and his bloody stump 30 yards, dragging blood behind him. And just imagine the pain. You just lost your leg. And now you're using your bloody stump to walk across the battlefield. Crawled 15, 20 yards pulled his Thompson submachine gun and opened fire on the enemy, killing three of them. Now, he was gunned down, but just imagine being one of those Italian soldiers or, or Germans, whoever happened to be there at that point. Right. Imagine seeing this guy lose a leg and keep hobbling towards you and then kill three of the guys right next to you. Just imagine how terrifying... That must have been for them. He's got to be like howling. And I mean, the, the amount of it's got to be incredible. Like to witness the fear of God could be struck into somebody when, when that kind of determination hits. Yeah. Oh, my. I mean, that's heroism on a level that's unprecedented. Man. I mean, what? I got a couple more. I, we have yeah, time, yeah. Right? yeah. Um, yeah so story. this one, this one was not in the first four letters of the alphabet but i just had to take it so josh i love the show mash uh, i watched it growing up yeah. at my great grandpa's house really you were a mash guy Lo huh? loved it i mean it was that or bonanza whatever happened to be on tv yeah, yeah. at the time um <laughs> yeah. he, he had limited shows so this guy benjamin lewis salomon salomon he was a trained dentist i believe but in war he was called to be a surgeon at basically a MASH hospital. Wow. A forward hospital. Wow. And he was serving in Saip at Saipan in the Marianas Island. He was in one of these hospital tents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as he is operating on an injured American, the Japanese overrun the MASH camp. Oh my. So he is, he is in the operating theater having to fight off Japanese soldiers running into the OR, grabbing 
weapons that just happen to be laying around and shooting them while still keeping the guy alive. While still <laughs> keeping the guy alive. Unbelievable. So his base gets overrun. He's he's dealing with the wounded from his base being overrun, and then they make it to the hospital tent. And the way they describe it, it's just stunning that he's sitting there d caring to these wounded, and the Japanese are, like, coming out of the woodwork. They're, like, crawling under the sides of the tent with their bayonets fixed, and he's kicking them, and he's punching them, and he's shooting them with whatever he can get. So he fends off all these Japanese inside of his actual tent. He gets all the wounded evacuated. And then he says, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to fight. It doesn't matter that I'm a trained dentist. doesn't matter. I'm a surgeon. I'm going to fight. So he goes out of that hospital tent and he gets up onto a machine gun emplacement. And he just starts mowing them down, mowing the Japanese down. Now he, he lost his life. Yeah. But when his body was found later, they discovered 98 Japanese dead bodies in front of his machine gun emplacement with him fallen behind the gun. Just, wow. just think about this. Wow. The fact that he was fighting off Japanese while he's in an OR, hero enough. But then he gets all the wounded out and then he kills 98 of the Next. attacking force could have been like wrist own. deep in a guy's guts throwing yeah. like stuff at them yeah. and shooting saving yeah. dude's life and then getting everybody out and then gets behind a machine gun and takes yeah. out 98 people 98 he had to reload the machine gun too i mean what so just i, I want to read this because it's it's it, it talks about when he's in the tent yeah as these soldiers are rushing in solomon kick the knife out of one of their hands shot another one, grabbed a bayonet, stabbed a third one, butted a fourth one in the stomach, and then one of the wounded Americans that he was tended to picked up a gun and killed the fourth one. <laughs> oh, my God. So, you can't write this yeah, stuff, yeah. dude. You can't write Unreal. it. You can't write it. You can't write it. And, and this, is, this is what heroism looks like, right? I mean, this is what we mean when we say the greatest generation. The greatest generation, obviously, 100%, the veterans who came home, right? Yeah. Absolutely belong in the greatest generation, but many of those men in that greatest generation never made it home because yeah. they put on display just how great they were. Yeah. I don't know. Th this one, I just, I, 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 I read, read it and I'm picturing it. I'm picturing it in my head. I'm just like, no, no. And it's just, See, it's just if, true. If, if, if I was like one of the John Wick producers or whatever, I would just pick one of these and make shorts yeah. about yeah. these, right? Like, and just make that moment happen and make it real, right? Yeah. That's heroism. I mean, probably giving away a million dollar idea here, but I hope somebody does it right. Or maybe oh. we find a way up, well, you know, give us money and we'll do ha it. Have you seen Hackshaw Ridge? Oh, yeah. That's a great movie, right? Incredible. Great movie. And wasn't that, wasn't that Mel Gibson? Yeah. And uh, uh, Andrew Garfield. Yeah, Andrew Garfield. But I think, I thought Mel Gibson directed it. Um, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Yeah, he did. Um, wow. Yeah. Good movie. I mean, the guy, he's a um, pacifist, for lack of a better word. Yeah. And yes. I, uh, spoiler alerts. He, oh, uh, the saves. movie's been out for a long time. I know, but um, <laughs> just saves, you know, again. Uh, <laughs> That's what the world wants. Everyone's spoiler. like, spoiler. It happened, it happened like 80 years right. ago. Hashtag spoiler, Max. <laughs> no, this was, this was a guy who was so, so adamantly a pacifist, he wouldn't pick up a rifle during training. He ran into battle as a combat medic without a rifle, and he saved everyone. Everybody. Saved people on the other side, too. Saved Japanese, too. Lowering them down a cliff on his own. Yeah. Wrapping a, a rope around them and lowering them down on his own. Fantastic movie, if anyone hasn't seen it. Um, oh. do, you want, do you want to talk about Vito Bertoldo? Oh, I'm sorry. I was going through a whole bunch of these, and I found a guy named Will, Thomas William Bennett. I, I, there's just so many cool ones, Max, and I'm sorry. I should have done Vito, but... It's okay. I, mean, I could bring... bring no, do, do, do this one. Do this one. Yeah, yeah, sure. a little let bit me, time. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me share my screen. We've got the time. Share the screen. Uh, Thomas William Bennett. This thing, yep, yep. That's my guy. Sorry. Folks at home. All right. Check this dude out. Vietnam War. He's distinguished himself on February 9th. 
and platoon was moving to assist the first platoon of company d they ran into some vietnamese ambush and became like engaged in some intense small arms fire automatic weapons mortars rockets as well as fire from a well fortified and numerically superior enemy unit in the initial barrage of fire three of the point members of the platoon fell wounded Cam corporal bennett with complete disregard for safety ran through heavy fire to his fallen comrades and managed life of saving aid under fire and then made repeated trips carrying the wounded same same sort of deal carrying the wounded men to positions of relative safety from which they would be medically evacuated from the battle position so it was it's kind of crazy you brought up hacksaw ridge as i was yeah, reading this because yeah. i was like whoa someone another another example of it but you know yeah. he was just in the middle of in the middle of it and he valiantly exposed himself to heavy fire in order to retrieve the bodies of several of the fallen so he went back for his fallen brothers and that's the one that always gets me they they're they're gone though but he's not going to leave anyone behind and that's like that takes a special kind of person that's what always grabs me so he uh on february he moved into a well sort well fortified enemy position became heavily engaged and that was the end of he leaped forward with complete disregard for his safety for his his life and his fellow soldiers and was mortally wounded daunted yeah. his comrades of his life was above the call of duty and they always unfortunately always end usually with gain his life yeah and that's the one that always grabs me man that's it like it gets hard to read these i mean it's great yeah. to, to see what they do but it's like it I've, I've tried me. to pick i've tried to pick ones where they survive because some of these stories are incredible time for a couple more let's yeah. uh l l I'll, I'll do uh vito bertoldo um so vito r bertoldo in france so he's he's in this town right yeah. and the germans are advancing so he's in this building and he says you know what this building isn't defensible so he ran out into the road with his gun and held the street for 12 hours he held back multiple attacks Holy while, com while completely exposed to their rifle fire, small arms fire, an 88 millimeter cannon from a tank, Whoa. and Whoa, what? machine gun fire. He held this street for 12 hours. So then, Against an 88? Yep, yep. You know, this is the first time. This is the last time. So he eventually retreats from the street, and he gets in back into the building, puts up a machine gun onto a table, and covered the building by just opening fire on the tanks with this machine gun. One of the tanks shot their 88 millimeter cannon into the room, knocked him over a tank round into the room. You don't walk away from that. He did. He got back to his weapon and opened fire on two enemy personnel carriers, taking them all out. Right. That's so a then, miracle. So then he's told to get out, get out and go to another building. So he did. He covered the withdrawal of everyone else. And then it happened again. He's still Whoa. in this window. And an 88 millimeter cannon didn't just fire into the room. It parked itself practically through the window. Oh my God. Now, uh, imagine the shockwave of an 88 millimeter cannon oh into a room. And, and we're not talking like modern rooms. These are no. French Riviera kind of oh. rooms plaster walls knocked him down right knocked him down killed other people in the room knocked him down but he got back up he got back up <laughs> he went back to his machine gun and opened fire <laughs> opened fire on them he, he, he won't go down wow he absolutely won't go down <laughs> so he's just holding this position and he and he, he kept going for 48 hours killing at least 40 of the enemy soldiers and wounding many more. And yes, he did survive this. Holy crap. And he did walk away. Yeah. 48, like, think about how tired you get when you just try to run around the block. Oh, yeah. Right? Or you try to fight someone for five minutes, like in a, in a spar or like wrestle. Yeah. You know what I mean? How tired you get. Now imagine having to shoot at Germans. <laughs> And yeah. having an eight, like yeah. having an eighty-eight go off near you, kind of liquefies most people. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, there's not much left. Oh, right? have you ever have you ever seen the uh, the YouTube videos of what happens if you put like a hot dog next to a fifty cal? 
The hot no. dog doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, Without the hot dog hitting right, right, right. it, just like the muzzle blast from the side, the hot dog ceases to exist. An 88 into a room that you're in, I'm stunned. And it happened to him twice. Twice, right? Twice. And he gets blown back. Now, his eardrums must be burst, right? His ears must yeah. be bleeding, right? Yeah. And he gets up, and he just keeps on fighting, Max. That, that's like a... Oh, no, he, he, he had tinnitus, right? <laughs> yeah, he right. had the ring. He had the ring. <laughs> Couple more, a couple more before we round, uh, wind down. Oh. Buford Theodore Anderson. So he is in Okinawa fighting the Japanese. Oh my! And the Japanese counterattacked his position and basically outflanked him. So he had to take all of his men and rush them into a tomb, an old tomb. And all he had was his M1 carbine. Oh which, really? M1 carbine, cool gun, not very powerful. Um, made for people. Made, they basically gave was it to the, the little cow? guys. Uh, yeah, it's it's thirty it was the, the thirty cal. Yeah, yeah. So they gave it to the little guys, and they gave it to power troopers, and they gave it to people inside of tanks because they couldn't have big rifles. But mainly, they gave it to little guys because an M1 Garand's heavy. So he had yeah. his M1 carbine, great gun. But as we heard from stories from uh, the Korean War when it was used, when the Koreans would come over a, a hill wearing multiple heavy coats because it was so cold, the M1 carbine wouldn't take them down. So just to show you how underpowered it is, it was possible to put on so many coats that you became bulletproof to an M1 carbine, <laughs> <Right. laughs> at least in Korea, at least in Korea. So he, he empties his M1 carbine mag, runs out of ammo. So he's looking around, what am I going to do? They're charging our position. They find enemy mortar shells. So they right. take the mortar shells, they remove the safeties. They start banging them on rocks to prime them and tossing them out of the tomb. Out Unreal. of the tomb. Real. <laughs> so they, like, imagine the Japanese are like, oh, we got them. They're in this old tomb. They're out of ammo. We can get them. And all of a sudden, you start taking mortar fire from inside this That's cave, inside this tomb. Right. right. It's like death from the tomb, man. That's terrifying. He, it wasn't just him, other people, other people in his unit were doing it. They killed 25 Japanese soldiers by taking the mortar shells, banging them and throwing them out the door. Wow. <clears throat> Manly. And, 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 <laughs> took out, and took out several machine gun uh, encampments too. Because they just kept doing it. They just kept bringing them. Oh, this is our, this is our thing now. This is our yeah. thing. Yeah. So, unbelievable. Buford. Unbelievable. And, um, did I do... I didn't do this one yet. Um, this is Andrew Edward Andrew Bennett. So he's in Germany. And his unit is being pinned down by by German forces that oh. were holed up in like a house. Okay. So he said, don't worry, guys. I got this. He crawls across the field on their blind spot. Doesn't get seen. Approaches the house where these Germans have their machine gun encampment. Pulls out his knife. Kills the sentry. One down. <laughs> Gets up, gets up to uh, the building, says, don't worry, guys, I got this. Kicks in the door. Uh-oh, there's seven Germans. What does he do? <laughs> oh, my God. What does he do? He takes his rifle. Boom, 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 ping. Kills three of them. So that's okay. Got my pistol. My, my trusty 1911. Do, 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 do. Kills three more. One left. Beats them to death. Beats them to death with his rifle. Clubbing to death with the butt of his rifle. <laughs> I just, I just thought this was incredible because th there's so like, many boom, stories. Boom, 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 yeah, boom, yeah, boom, yeah. Boom, and then boom, ping, boom. Ah, ping. Like, oh, don't worry, because like when when the M1 Garand when it goes ping, yeah, in combat that tells the enemy you're out of ammo, right? Oh yeah. Well, not not for him, not for Edward Bennett. <laughs> he would have been at forty to, to crawl to crawl across a field, sneak up on a machine gun position kill one guy with a knife, three with a rifle, three with a handgun, and one by clubbing him to death with the rifle that's out of bullets. I don't know. That was just, to me, I, I, I wanted to tell the story because human it's being. just badass. Yeah. And, and, and <laughs> I, would, I would be remiss. Manly. I would be remiss if we didn't end. I, sh I told you this one, and you didn't yeah, believe me. This is, this is yours. Yeah, you go. You go. You didn't believe me. This is my it, trusty it was... 1911 pistol. I love it. And you know why I love it? It's the only handgun that's ever taken down a Japanese Zero. See, that... <laughs> At first, I thought you were full of it. Full of it. 
No, it's I true. Believe it. I believe that. Owen Baggett. Owen Baggett was in a bomber. He was a bo- in a bomber crew, and he was uh, he was bombing over the Pacific. Oh my! And at one point, his bomber gets shot down oh. by enemy zeros. So him and the rest of his team bail out of the bomber before it crashes. They all have parachutes. Open up their parachutes, and they're drifting down oh, um, to the ocean to the, the the land wherever they were. Well, in aerial combat, it was like an unwritten rule that you don't open fire on people who just bailed out of a plane. There's no sport to it, right? So in, in, in for the Americans, for the Germans, for the British, there's no sport to it. In this instance, the Japanese Zero started opening fire on him and his oh comrades. Oh, my God. The other people who just bailed, Owen Baggett. Oh, my. And here he is, Owen Baggett. Wow. Young kid. Yeah. Young kid. Looks like he's barely 20. Like he was 18. 25. He was 24, 23. He's in his 20s. Wow. Wow. So he's like, okay, well, I, I, I know what I'm going to do. Yeah. He plays dead. He plays Smart. dead in his Smart. canopy, pretending to be dead. And as the Zeros are strafing the rest of, of his uh, bomber crew, he's sitting there playing dead. One of the Zeros flies up to him to check him out. Is he dead? I don't know. As the plane gets really close, which those planes, you can fly them pretty pretty slow if you really yeah. wanted to and glide yeah. in. As the plane approaches, Owen Baggett wakes up from his pretend sleep, grabs his night, trusty 1911 handgun, 45, seven rounds, uh-huh. seven. opens fire on the Japanese pilot, striking the canopy, and the plane falls out of the sky. He doesn't know what happens to it. Right. Fast forward. He <laughs> is captured by the Japanese. Uh-huh. Right. The Japanese heard about what he did. And as bad as the Japanese were to soldiers, the Japanese in this camp actually thought he was kind of a badass. Th- they heard that he had shot down a zero with his handgun and they actually gave him a little respect for that. As much respect uh-huh. as could be given in a Japanese prison camp. Sure. But while he's in camp, an officer is brought in as a, as a prisoner. And the officer tells him, here's the story that he's telling everyone. Oh, yeah, I opened fire. I don't know what happened to the plane. It disappeared. It went under the clouds. Who knows? But I, I definitely got shots off and I it hit the canopy. So mm-hmm. I, 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 I hit him. <laughs> this officer who gets into the camp, he says, oh, no. Oh, no. You didn't just hit him. We found the plane crashed not too far from where you say this happened. And we found the pilot with a bullet hole in his head. So no, you didn't just hit the plane. This, this, this uh, officer's telling him in the prison camp, you just hit the plane, you killed him and it crashed. And so that corroboration for Owen Baggett, he took this story. He, he told this story and he, he was adamantly, um, he, he adamantly told this. Everyone who's ever heard this story says that they, when they heard him tell it, it, he wasn't a liar. Now, yeah. obviously, these stories are hard to prove. The Japanese didn't like to keep records of things like this. The Americans didn't always keep records of when they found enemy planes because they found a lot of them. There isn't corroborating evidence to necessarily support this. Mm-hmm. But everyone who's ever heard the story says he was adamant, he was believable, and people in the prison camp says it was corroborated by other people who were brought into the camp. So whether it's provable or not, I want to believe, I believe. Great. great and that is why line. the 1911 is the best handgun in the world. Only handgun ever to take down an enemy plane at altitude. Well, Mr. McGuire, you have made the sale on the 1911 to me. Let's go start the paperwork, and we'll, we'll go right now on it. I mean... well, 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 you, have a, you have a 2011, so you're you're close enough. Yeah. Um, <coughs> no, I have I have a 19. The the seven shot 1911 is yeah. probably there's a reason they call it the shooter's gun, right? Yeah. I mean, it just feels right. Oh, it does. I and I just held it in my hand. And I got. Good I pickles. want it to be. I mean, could you imagine the kind of balls it took to? shoot yeah. your night you have seven yeah. shots and he was going to do something yeah. with it right that was he was yeah. going to do something with it and he did yeah. that's an incredible story man yeah and i and hope you know, yeah you know what? everyone who's I ever heard it believe. says it was true 
I want to. So, um, I'm not someone who's going to say, "Oh well, the Japanese didn't admit it." Well, no, no well, shit, this. they didn't admit it. <laughs> right. You think they're going to admit <laughs> that? Really that, that, that they were committing war crimes and then they got shot down by a handgun? Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> think about it. Two and two. That's why I do this yeah. show. It always ends on positive notes. That was actually great. I love, I love those stories, man. And I, I recommend that everyone go to. Yeah. Um, this website, cmohs.org. Spend a little time. You can search by war, by theater. Yeah. Um, you can find. You can search by whether they were given the Congressional Medal yeah. of Honor uh, posthumously or not, and just read some of these stories because it's 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 good to take a step back. Like we 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 started this episode talking about Diane Feinstein, how she was the greatest enemy of the Constitution that this country has seen in a long time. It's good to take a step back and read the stories of the men who literally put their lives on the line to protect that constitution, to ensure that the American flag moved forward and that the rights that they had come to love and respect didn't perish from the earth. Because as, as much as like we didn't really think that the Japanese were going to invade the mainland, it would have been terrible if we had lost World War II if Nazism had been able to truly take over Europe and, and hop over, I mean, it would, it would have been terrible, terrible. So I, I highly recommend that everyone go to these websites and, and also look at like Silver Star. The Silver Star stories, they might not have gotten the Medal of Honor. Some of those are crazier. And you're asking yourself, how didn't they get the Medal of Honor? Yeah. Like the, the Bronze Star, you're looking at this like, this guy killed 100 people. Like, like there's a there's a Silver Star story I, saw, I read once. A guy was blinded, and he had a machine gun uh, in his hands, and another guy was injured, and the other guy is calling out where to shoot. And they defended the bank of a river all night. Wow. Left, left, yeah. left. Yeah, one yeah, o'clock, yeah. one o'clock. Yeah. Up, down. Um, these stories are amazing, and oh. and it, it's, it's always a good time mm-hmm. to remember what our rights, what our liberties are based on the foundation of, that's built under them because it's not just uh, some men in wigs who signed a document all those years ago. It has the debt paid has been paid in blood and sacrifice over many, many years. And it's good to read those stories. So we'll continue to do this. Uh, I don't know if it'll be every week, but I enjoy it and people seem to enjoy it and the stories need to be told. And if you have someone in your family who's a veteran who hasn't told these stories to you and it is kind of, on the fence about whether he wants to tell the stories about his combat experience. Tell them that the stories deserve to be heard. And there's far too many stories that have died with the heroes who weren't ready to tell them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's it. That's it. It's it's Friday. Happy Friday. Yeah. Enjoy the weekend, everyone. Check out all the links in the description. If you want to, if you want to support the show, um, prepsos.com. There's a link in the description. You want to buy some survival gear. um, Use our code. I think it's code max. Use the code in the description. We get a little bit of money. Help support the show. Um, check out all those links. Subscribe to the audio version. Subscribe on Rumble or YouTube. Um, just check it out. And have a great weekend, everyone. And enjoy the freedoms that so many have fought to preserve. That's it for this edition of the podcast. My name is Max McGuire. I'm Josh Hammerly. Remember, the fight to take back the country is not over yet. The only way we win is if we all stand up and fight together. See you next week. <laughs>